Hello everybody, my name is Danae and I'm the Digital Innovation Officer for the French Embassy in Tallinn. I am really glad to welcome you to this first podcast. Each month, the French Institute in Estonia will record an in-depth look at the latest innovation in the field of arts, diplomacy and emerging technology. Today, our topic is virtual reality and emotions. It's a very interesting topic. It's also quite complicated at first sight. But fear not, because in order to understand it, we are really well accompanied by three talented artists, researchers, and scientists. In the studio with us, we have Marie-Laure Cazan. Marie-Laure, you are a French filmmaker, new media artist, as well as researcher, and the EU Mobilitas postdoctoral fellow at Tallinn University. Your area of research is primarily emotive VR, and you are currently conducting research that will lead to the production of a virtual reality movie influenced by the viewer emotions. You are very welcome. Thank you. Pia Attica, you are an EU Mobilitas Plus top researcher at Tallinn University. You are a Finnish film director, screenwriter and research professor at the Baltic School of Film, Media and Art School of Tallinn University. Filmmaker and scholar, your research concerns psychophysiological and emotional basis of cinematic system. Welcome. Thank you. Matti Motus, you are from the field of computer science and dealing with the human-computer interaction. In this project, you are operating physiological sensor signal to detect mental states. Welcome. Thank you. So you are all working together on a topic that is very interesting. Can you talk a little bit uh, about your project to us? I will start. So I came here with a EU grant uh, to conduct a project uh, which has uh, two sides. One is a scientific side and uh, the other is an art side. This is an art science project. So I collaborate here with Matti Motus uh, on the scientific aspect. And uh, I work together with uh, Pia Tika, who is uh, very expert in this, in this kind of projects. And uh, also we are talking here about interactive cinema, but not interactive cinema in the way you push a button and it's changing something or like in games. But uh, we collect the data of the viewer Uh, his or her emotional data and out of this data uh, the emotions of the viewer are changing in real time the film okay and so Matty you are working on the technical aspect of the project could you talk to us a little bit about it yes it's a very interesting project that I am now involved in and uh, my part of this project is to make sure the experimental Uh, setups are all right and the sensors are all working. You might mm, ask what is the role of sensors. We are measuring, uh, or at least we are trying to measure human emotions uh, and trying to make sense out of the, their state of mind uh, while watching the movie. What... Um My Lord uh, mentioned uh, about the the virtual virtual reality and 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 cinema. So uh, and this interactivity. So one important point also is what we we share in this group is that we also want to tell cinematic stories. And this was uh, quite a unique approach. Uh, has been sti it's still quite a unique approach where you actually create uh, scripted stories and then. Uh, change these on fly and and uh, especially in doing this in virtual reality environment because typically uh, when interactive cinema emerged in the beginning of 2000 it was really the excitement of uh, pushing the buttons and giving the participant the right to change everything change change your ending create your own film but as filmmakers we feel that that with our experience with our education our 
practice that we feel that we <laughs> handle relatively well in, the, in terms of creating emotional situations. That is that is totally lost with with uh, with when uh, uninitiated or un- people kind of get hold of the stories how can you surprise yourself for example like if you if you are able able to control the whole story how do you surprise yourself and and surprises and and new uh adventures are like the key thing also mm-hmm. in in telling stories and and this kind of where the user has all the all the control of making decisions it kind of loses this uh, crafted aspects that filmmakers are are kind of best to bring forth for the for the participants i think if you, there is also this problem that uh, when you are watching a, a movie and you are asked to to make decisions then you 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 go out of the immersion in in the movie and it's really two kind of uh, ways to behave to 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 make decisions and to to, to be immersed in the, in the narrative so uh, with the that's why I propose uh, to have this implicit interaction we call it implicit interaction it means that uh, it's not uh, the viewer doesn't make any decisions but uh, it is the data coming out of him or her that uh, that makes the changements in in the film and uh, is not really aware of of his state of mind or his uh, emotion or her emotions, but they, they react uh, with the, they act into the film. And for me, it is really the center of the, of, of uh, my interest is to understand uh, what's happening into, into the person who is uh, viewing the film because uh, the film is a kind of, uh, is a kind of in between uh, the filmmaker and the viewer, uh, because the perception of the viewer tra- is transforming uh, what he's perceiving. This is also happening every day, every minute in our world. And um, so we in life, we are always transforming what we see and according to our memory, according to our emotions, uh, according to many, many things. Uh, and these things have, uh, can be also perceived uh, with the physio sensors because there is a connection between what's in mind and, and in the body, you know, it's a whole, whole and entire thing together. So, but Mati has something to say about this specific. Yes. I can see, to follow uh, Marilor's um, thought, uh, if we want to know uh, what is in people's mind and we, we would really like the film story to follow this state of mind, uh, it, it would be two different follow-ups. Either we use uh, people's um, reports, what they say about what they think their mind has, or what we measure out of their body, which they cannot cheat, like the (laughs) lie detector. This is really where the multidisciplinarity of of our collaboration comes into play, because without the people like uh, like Mati here, uh, with the full expertise on physiology, on on, on understanding how, how first of all, to measure the data, and what what measurements are most relevant for understanding which part of the of the human emotion or human human behavior in general affective cognitive uh, processes? So um, uh, it is it is clear that um, that projects like this cannot exist without without this uh, multi multidisciplinary expertise. And uh, and also uh, in its uh, in my um, inactive cinema, which uh, which I I worked in in my PhD in two thousand. Eight. Um, so um, also in in this project, I had first of all you need a systems architect to create create the architecture of that that uh, behavioral uh, computational system. Then you need a specialist in uh, physiology and understanding human bodily bodily uh, responses. And then the, it's a it's a shared project where you kind of interpret all these. Uh, computational and physiological and narrative things together into a one one interplay between different disciplines, and and so it, it's it's a it's a fascinating work for for 
you know, everybody to be able to sh- share and learn from other disciplines. And, and uh, so people like Mati, we artists are learning, learning a lot of, of, of uh, physiology. Of, of, uh, yes, my PhD project was about human-computer interaction. And firstly, I, I uh, tried to quantify aesthetics, which ended up with um, quite a lot of confusion because aesthetics isn't as easy to quantify as it seemed in the first place. Now, with the help of physiological sensors and the interpretation, uh, we would also like uh, to quantify the pleasure so that we can track uh, live how people feel on the good bad scale and if as my background is human computer interaction the latest password uh, is user experience and experience design everyone speaks of um, experience in business as well as in uh, human computer interaction customer experience or the user experience whatever and the experience in the most general way can be expressed as good or bad feeling and it's mostly about the pleasure where the pragmatic goal doesn't make much sense and that's what really fits the interactive movies and uh, the arts uh, that people must enjoy no matter if they have a goal in that I'm not sure about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you think that the um, narrative itself is a goal and they are aiming at something that they expect will come in the end, right? Well, no, I think it's very much about artists, very much about perception and, and to share new perceptions and to enrich uh, the viewers with other perceptions. So I, I think it's not... Only well, it depends what you. Where is your pleasure? You know, if you, it's very complicated to 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 speak in terms of pleasure, or uh, positive or negative uh, emotions, and uh, this is actually a very interesting point because uh, then we have in this kind of project, art and science project, we have to confront uh, scientific views with artistic views. Like, you know, artists, we could say, are kind of experts on on emotion, perception, but and it's very subtle, but very difficult to quantify also. And to be in this crossing crossing moment, uh, crossing these uh, art and science views on the subject, it's a great challenge that's really the, the, the core of the project. I, I just uh, recently, the weekend, I participated in, in uh, online in uh, neuroesthetics uh, seminar in Stuttgart uh, University, and uh, this was uh, one of the discussions uh, with uh, between neuro between scientists and uh, between uh, aesthetics, so humanist people who study literature and, and aesthetics, people who are like uh, whose discipline is in on aesthetics. Uh, are typically uh, really irritated by the re- re- reductionist way of expressing human emotions, but it is also clear that that when when uh, you do uh, experience scientific experiments, uh, you need to kind of frame out and 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 do some some sort of reduction in order to be able to quantify and and uh, study uh, specifically framed topics. And and here in this um, uh, Zoom meeting. Um, or in this seminar, uh, one one of the issues was the term liking, um, that uh, some humanists were really irritated of uh, scientists using, uh, do you like this picture or not? But th- there was a scientist who gave a, a very, very good um, explication of why why it is necessary to frame that down. So this comes to to also, it's part of the multidisciplinarity that, that, uh, that uh, liking in, in science terms, it, it provides data and information that we want to look at. But of course, it doesn't, doesn't in any ways cover anything related to, to um, 
complexity of the artistic piece itself. Uh, that, that's actually what we try to compare in this study because we're going to have some physiological data uh, like arousal and uh, in the next uh, step we will have a valence values, so it means the positive and negative out of EEG head sets too, combined with the VR headset. So we, we're going to have this, uh, okay, at this point there is high arousal or the, with the eye tracking or the, 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 the gaze is very uh, moving a lot. What's happening? And then we will have the, the, the film and the sound. So I know as a, as the filmmaker, I know what's happening there. What, what were my intentions towards the viewers? And also I have some, interview and maybe at this point I interviewed the person and she said oh yeah at this moment I was thinking about my grandmother or whatever you know and then I can I can try to to put together all this uh, all this data and and start to have a little little idea about what is a positive negative uh, arousal high or low or uh, a tracking moving a lot or not you know then then it's it's a first you know a first uh, it's very large subject it's and we are very far to 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 understand really what's happening but uh, uh, it's it's a li little way to start okay so that that's really interesting but as a complete uh, science noob could you tell us a little bit uh, marty how what exactly do you measure like what's the quantitative sides of emotions oh yes let's keep it easy and simple. And we do the most basic measurements. The, the most basic measurement that is a, a component in, uh, in light detector as well. It's the skin electrical conductance, uh, or we call it electrodermal skin response, which means that we can measure how much electricity can go through the skin in the time. And this tiny little measure follows the uh, emotional response or emotional reaction of our, our mind. So this is how we can track if people are emotionally reacting to the movie. It doesn't tell whether they are, uh, have positive or negative emotions. However, we can understand uh, through that measure, uh, uh, how much or how emotional this movie is. And this is already something as simple as it is, but we can already learn quite a lot. Uh, for example, if there is a story of the film, it begins slowly and uh, in rather humble way. And at some point in the towards the end, the movie goes more thrilling, then we can measure how the emotionality starts growing in the end. What else do we measure currently in this study in Tallinn is uh, the gaze behavior. Uh, gaze behavior means that we track the attention in 3D environment, where people look, how they turn their head, maybe also how the, how the sound affects the attention people have. But not only attention, but also the activity of the gaze uh, gives some information. Uh, if they are bored, probably the gaze is lazy. And if they are excited, then they try to look much more around and fixate the gaze on different objects. Eye tracking provides even more information besides the uh, coordinates of the gaze. Uh, it has the pupillometry. And uh, the size of the pupil will also provide some information about emotionality. And that's we try to use as well. And as all the physiometric signals, they are very individual from people to people. The results are not so precise, so it is always better to combine several metrics together to get a more meaningful information about, about the states of mind. 
Wow, <laughs> that's uh, impressive. Marilor, how will you implement uh, the data yeah, that you get from the study in changing the movie afterwards? What kind of movie will we be able to experience uh, once the research is done? Well, the, the movie has been uh, made already. It's uh, called uh, Freud's Lost Hypnosis. It's about uh, <clears throat> the beginnings of, of Sigmund Freud when he He used uh, hypnosis uh, before to to cure psychosomatic psychosomatic uh, problems. This is a very point where when uh, he will uh, stop uh, this practice, uh, according to the the scenario Freud that uh, has been written by uh, Jean Paul Sartre for John Huston long time ago, uh, and uh, John Huston didn't use actually uh, the whole scenario by Sartre, which was uh, much, uh, which was about uh, maybe 10 hours long. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I got inspired by this uh, scenario Freud, very, very interesting. So I don't know exactly, uh, it's not something out of a biography that uh, Freud has had this specific patient and was facing a problem in this uh, hypnosis uh, moment and and then decided to to stop hypnosis but uh, this is what is the what is the content of the film and uh, in that film you can have you will have uh, when it will be launched uh, the possibility to to watch it uh, from the freud point of view or from the patient point of view and each version has a, a, a specific sound and specific hallucinations specific uh, visual effects uh, which will be changing according to the emotions of the viewer And uh, we have been discussing with uh, Marilor actually about uh, also of a uh, Freud character as an as an uh, interactive or what I call inactive avatar. So a character actually that is also adaptive to adaptive to human behavior, participant behavior, and and this is then in in the domain that I'm studying here at Tallinn University currently, which is uh, how people interact with, um, uh, virtual characters in immersive virtual environments in, in narrative contexts and, and how, how then this kind of, uh, what I call an active loop. So unconscious, unconsciously happening an active loop between the human, human behavior, human responses to the, to the character and, and, and their character's behavior back to the human and so on and so on, this infinite loop uh, kind of um, builds then the tension. And and then this would be kind of then uh, expanded or maybe let's say future, future futuristic project where this kind of uh, human uh, like characters then will be active, actively interacting uh, in just as it would be uh, Mati and myself here, here uh, interacting. Uh, so maybe something like this will be happening then in the future in, in these narrative stories. So, for example, if uh, the viewer and the character in the movie have some kind of empathic connection, and this might come out as well, and depending on the empathic capabilities of the viewer, uh, he or she might have different emotions. All of this is very interesting, but maybe a little bit frightening as well when you think about the implication in the marketing fields or like business and economically related. What do you think that this kind of technologies and way of thinking uh, cinema could like induce in the future? Will the movies be extremely different and mostly um, shots in virtual reality or for for the web-free um, space, will it change a lot of what we have to expect from cinema in the future? I, I think the key thing uh, in, in everything that we, we do and is, we are interested as humans is narratives. So uh, eventually it all comes to the camp, campfire storytelling. It, it really doesn't matter 
what kind of uh, medium we are using for creating these uh, situations. So uh, if you really want to look at the core of the cinema and, and or the human, human being humans, it's about storytelling. And, and storytelling is always sharing. It's always telling, telling stories to others so that we can share the same story or maybe maybe we disagree, uh, but, but this, this story is kind of build the world. So I'm not so concerned of this kind of tec- technological innovations as such, also considering how, how really demanding they are to develop. For example, uh, this kind of uh, idea that they would be human robots just like us, actually, and uh, I can confess I'm not uh, Pia because Pia has an injured hand, so she's at home now, so she sent me. I'm an avatar of <laughs> Pia Tikka. Uh, so uh, I'm, I know that, that we fooled you, right? Pia is laughing at home now for your um, <laughs> surprise. The, the key is in, in all, all these kind of uh, new technologies uh, is that um, how we humans treat one another and, and we need to learn from these stories what it is most important thing in, in being, being humans. Also, especially in VR, uh, there is the question of empathy, uh, which uh, maybe for, to explain is to, to feel in the, in, the, in the place of the person in front of you. And uh, I must say, uh, with the experience I have with VR, that... It is extremely helpful. There are many experiments, of course, but uh, like uh, uh, by a legislator, for example, and you can be in the place of the other and understand better what you are doing and how the other is feeling. And I had this also in films, uh, for example, uh, it was uh, homeless people and uh, the police was co- were coming into their tents and... Uh, and and then I, I realized much more what it was to feel in the place of these people because of the virtual world. I, I think it, it doesn't look like obvious at the first place uh, uh, the, the, to develop more sensitivity towards the others uh, in having this kind of uh, high uh, technological setup. But... Indeed, uh, VR is very specific for this. Yes, you don't you don't have to yourself feel feel uh, horrifying situations that you might end up like I was ending up in falling in the in the street of Tallinn, mm-hmm. and and no everybody walked by nobody helped me, so uh, uh, that was quite a traumatic experience. So uh, it also this kind of experiences if you. If you experience this in in virtual reality, you can walk out from there safe and healthy, and 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 but you have learned something. But uh, mm-hmm. so the, in this this kind of cases uh, cases, for example, virtual reality is argued to be really really good uh, uh, method for training people to treat others, especially when you are put into the position of the other and you are you are treated badly or or uh, you you. F- Feel uh, the, on the faces of others their their rejection. So that, that's a really helpful experience. <laughs> so much about the empathy on the street. Uh, I would wonder if um, artificial intelligence could provide more empathy than real human. This is this is a very good question because we basically can program <laughs> the artificial uh, agents. To always feel empathic and always, always uh, help people. Actually, I have to be honest. There was eventually one biker who stopped and stayed with me until the ambulance came. So that was uh, not so bad after all. But uh, mm-hmm. but uh, this uh, this um, uh, this uh, idea of uh, artificial intelligence and and if we think of the the, the field that we are, we all three are, and, and we are working towards. Uh, future goals with small steps. So um, one of the interesting uh, news that I just read is that one of the Google um, companies, uh, engineers was, um, uh, developers was uh, just, uh, he was uh, sent to a vacation um, because he argued that the artificial intelligence that he was working with had become sentient, that it really made sensible sentences. It really understood the conversation was really human-like conversation 
and he was convinced that this artificial um, agent has reached the level of human sentience. <laughs> That's exactly like our physiological interpretation. The making psychometric interpretations upon physiometric signals, this uh, requires artificial intelligence. And as already said, that most burning problem in uh, sense making of physiometric signals lay, lays in in individual responses. Each person responds differently. Uh, the bodily responses are different. So some of them got sweaty with uh, more with positive emotions, other ones uh, with negative emotions. However, artificial intelligence must be able to learn for each person. So if you get some personalized interactive movie, it could learn you uh, in the way. Uh, it, I wouldn't wonder if this engineer from Google got either fired or sent on the vacation because of the creating too good uh, artificial intelligence. My wife always told me, don't worry that your artificial intelligence systems won't pass the Turing test. I know quite a lot of people who won't pass the Turing test. I think that's a very good conclusion. <laughs> okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much, uh, all of you, for joining us today. And uh, if you want to participate, talk about a topic in digital innovation, don't hesitate to reach out to us. See you soon in Paris or Tallinn.